Welcome again to another round of the Fawcett Health Extension uh, Group, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. And thank you so, so much for joining today's meeting on a topic I think that's of personal interest to many in this group, even if not uh, directly relevant to much of um, kind of, like, let's say, the more uh, professional uh, research interest of all of us, um, even though uh, I think the two are, are really well related. Uh, and we're today we're going to talk about biohacking, um, COVID-19 and beyond and specifically on supplements, diets, and lifestyle. And uh, we're gonna start with a quick discussion and presentation by Steve Fawkes, um, who will give us an intro into biohacking in relation to aging, and uh, then uh, with a specific focus on COVID-19. And then we'll follow with a, a discussion by Amy Perel on vitamin D in the context of infectious diseases. And then I, I think this is really kind of like, just to kind of kickstart us into a discussion, because I know that Many people here on this call are keeping their um, kind of like vicarious, vicariously keeping their lists of different supplements and lifestyle changes that uh, that they're doing. So I think it would be really fun to compare notes. I know that this is a topic that usually reaches really high interest in the polls that we do at the beginning uh, of the meeting. So I'm really glad that so many people here have joined. I know that you know there's probably a, a, a host of different information out there. So it'd be really, really fun to bring some kind of like light into the darkness and to compare notes amongst all of us. And let's see, I think that's all. Uh, I think uh, without further, uh, further ado, I wanna kind of like give the stage to Steve Fawkes who will present uh, an intro on, on biohacking and I'll share his new book that was already shared in the, uh, in the intro email uh, to today's meeting here in the chat. Uh, and then I'm hoping we can launch into some of the discussion questions as well that uh, were already raised in the email. So thank you so much, uh, Steve, for joining. Um, and yeah, I encourage everyone to kind of like be active in the chat uh, and I'll post some more info on you uh, in the chat as well. So thank you so, so much for coming uh, and uh, I'll enter you in the chat. Okay, so I'll start by sharing my screen and activating my uh... Uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Oh, I have a choice of which one I do. Okay. So how is that? Looks good to me. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about one of the benefits of COVID, and that is that we're all becoming painfully aware of pre-existing conditions. And I think that this um, bodes well for um, the whole concept of aging and uh, life extension studies, because a lot of people who have been on the sidelines regarding this issue, issue now feel it's a matter of life and death. So we have all kinds of issues that are popping up, being elderly, um, having diabetes, obesity, and each one of these things has underlying conditions that are subtle enough that it may not be um, made uh, conspicuous to people by, for example, their medical practitioner. So if you're elderly, well, that's natural. If you don't have diabetes, you might have insulin resistance. If you're overweight, you might have leptin resistance. So it goes down that line of all these things having an overt um, aspect of the condition and then more subtle versions. And this is bringing all of this to our attention. So this is a teaser. This is not meant to be a, a detailed discussion of this topic, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a subject that is absolutely critical to this issue of what's going on with COVID and um, I'd love to spend a whole hour um, discussing this kind of issue. Um, redox potential turns out to be one of the reasons that people die from COVID infections. They get oxidatively stressed and their antioxidant defense system fails and they go into a cytokine storm and pretty soon they're, they're no longer with us. So unlike the, the pH environment where you kind of live in the middle and um, protons are exchanged incredibly rapidly, and so everything evens out in terms of pH. Um, that's not the case for redox potential. We live way at the bottom of the scale, um, uh, and um, there's a lot of forces that, that drag us up into the oxidative side of things, and 
we need to have a, and especially immune system function, which operates with superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl radicals. And we need to have the, um, the green level and the blue level active to defend against that oxidative stress. So I'm gonna hopefully be invited back to give a detailed talk on this, but the, the conceptual um, phenomena that you see here has to do with uh, glutathione, which is GSH on the chart, and vitamin C, this is vit C, and DHA, which is oxidized vitamin C, GSSG is oxidized glutathione, and those are all down at the bottom end of the, of the chart. Even the oxidized versions of these things are um, more reduced than the um, environment that's created by the immune system. So here's my um, antiviral agent summary that I'll be talking about, and I invite any questions about any of these. Vitamin D3, vitamin A, selenium, zinc, vitamin C, and then other, other kinds of constitutional conditions and metabolic conditions. And at the bottom, I have some hypotheticals that are getting some attention that could probably use more attention. Uh, butylated hydroxytoluene, which is an antiviral agent against all lipid envelope viruses, and may um, it does cross into the blood brain, um, cross through the blood brain barrier into the brain to deal with central nervous system viral infections, and COVID-19 is one of those. Um, this is pretty much the same as the other list, except that there are um, the therapeutic agents are items that have been investigated that wouldn't necessarily be primary therapy, but are with COVID like heparin, which deals with coagulation phenomena that are secondary to the virus and to oxidation. And in parentheses after that would be uh, natokinase and lumbrokinase, which are over the counter versions of heparin and they operate in hours, whereas heparin operates in minutes. Uh, potassium, which is um, uh, potassium loss is associated with COVID infections, um, influences on uh, ketosis and, and uh, the use of carbohydrates in the diet or autophagy and minimizing protein in the diet um, as therapeutic strategies. And of course, zinc and hydroxychloroquine and with quercetin as being another um, zinc active agent that is being promoted um, as a dietary supplement alternative. Um, these are some quotes here about um, vitamin D3. Um, the amount, this is, this is probably dates back about um, two months in terms of the currents of this. So there's a lot of this stuff that's been coming out since then that isn't documented here, but the evidence is quite compelling that low vitamin D is a massive risk factor and um, as a direct prediction of mortality risks. Here's a general um, chart looking at how this relates to mortality with in aging um, in terms of all-cause all mortality or in terms of cardiovascular or stroke mortality. And you'll notice that the difference between these curves is that the, the Garland et al. Um, curve shows no uptick in the higher levels of vitamin D Whereas the, the earlier ones in green and blue, um, those looking at um, uh, cardiovascular and stroke mortality did not um, uh, um, control for the fact that a lot of the elderly are now being recommended to um, take high dose vitamin D. So that automatically causes an escalation of that risk from that particular kind of um, advice the implementation of that advice. Vitamin A, as far as I know, has not been um, seriously tested in terms of COVID-19, but it's got a strong correlation with other viral conditions. Um, the upper tolerable limit is listed as 10,000 IU per day. I take 15,000 and hospitalized children with measles are given 400,000 on two consecutive days, which decreases their death rate by 68%. So there's a lot of research in vitamin A for other lipid envelope viruses. It just, as far as I know, hasn't yet been done with COVID. Selenium. Here's a graph from a Chinese study that showed um, 
correlation of selenium levels in different cities and um, with um, uh, survival risk. Uh, these are hospitalized patients, so the survival risks are fairly, uh, fairly low. Um, a cure rate of 20% for people with selenium deficiency to 60%, that's a sign that these people are um, seriously ill from COVID infection. Here's another sample, more recent data. It shows uh, in the red are patients who died, and red and pink, and in the blue and, and uh, um, colors, uh, patients who survived. And you can see a fairly strong correlation. And the green area is population controls. They weren't part of the study, but they were other reference data indicating what the, the um, non-hospitalized uh, patients were at. And you see a very nicely linear or near linear relationship. Here's another display of that showing the, um, the influence of selenium over time into the infection where the people who survived have a escalating selenium influence and the people who um, died either have a steady one or a de declining one. Zinc and hydro hydro hydroxychloroquine is one of those things that I use as an example of crony science in operation in our society today. And all you have to do to disprove the hydroxychloroquine and zinc um, thesis is to test hydroxychloroquine without zinc. And that's been done. There's actually four cases where zinc was used alone. And this is an example of one where the, the uh, clinical course where um, the, um, the dosing of, it was with hydroxychloroquine and the zinc was administered um, uh, uh, when uh, in higher amounts at that particular point in time. So before that, this, this person was taking, I think it was two um, sublingual tablet or um, lozenges a day. And then at some point they increased it to 10 a day and started to recover. So this is, um, this particular person was without, um, was with hydroxychloroquine, but the three other people reported in that study um, it was zinc alone that was used. So looking at zinc and copper, we have all this positive stuff going on with copper. And the doses of zinc that were used in that previous page were uh, in the hundreds of milligram dose range. Given that the RDA is somewhere in the realm of 15 or 20, you're talking 10 times more zinc than would normally be sustainable or maybe um, therapeutic for a short period of time. And so part of one of the what, of biohacking this issue is how do you sustain high dose zinc without it interfering with copper metabolism and developing side effects relating to collagen or uh, antioxidant defense or support of thyroid hormone. And th that is to actually um, supplement copper by non-oral route so that the mucous membranes, the sinuses, the lungs, the digestive system can all have high zinc, but the copper comes in through a, a, a separate epithelial tissue like the skin. And um, I've got youngerphenotype.com here on the screen because at least one person a week, if not more, calls me up and asks me where to get it. What's the reasoning behind that separate routes again? Say that again. What is the reasoning behind wanting to have separate entry pathways again? I still didn't get that. It was just- From a gangrene. Um, okay, one, I will try one last time and then give up. I've what, got bigger volume now. What is the reasoning behind the separate entry pathways for copper and zinc again, please? Oh, because they're competitive. And if you take copper at the same time as zinc, you decrease its bioavailability. That's not only just in terms of absorption in the gut, but it's in terms of the local loading effects that you get. So if you're trying to, for example, decrease gut permeability, you need the, um, the zinc to be um, saturating the tight junction gaps in the gut and any copper that you take will compete against that saturation. Good question, thank you. 
So now to vitamin C, which is, uh, in my opinion, the number one thing to keep in mind for COVID infections. Um, it's a non-replenishable member of the antioxidant defense system and is basically the only non-replenishable one. Um, the only way you can keep your vitamin C um, stable is by recycling it and um, we cannot make it. We're one of the few species on the planet that cannot make vitamin C. And so in the chain of antioxidant defense, vitamin C is the weak link. Um, mammals make 10 to 20 grams. Um, the RDA is less than 200 grams, and ten, you know, 100 to 200 grams. So you're dealing with a, uh, a human operation of maybe 1% of what other mammals do. And mammals make twice as much when they're infected and we can't do that. Um, gorillas, as an example, get heart disease when they eat human food. And there's been an epidemic of gorilla um, heart disease in American um, zoos. Both uh, vitamin C and glutathione are recycled by NADPH, which is our primary cellular antioxidant. That's the blue color in the diagram that I showed earlier. And that's, the, that's what balances the oxidative stress of the um, immune system. As the immune system is cranking out things like hydroxyl radicals um, that's pulling our redox potential up, um, NADH is pulling it down. Um, high dose intravenous vitamin C has resolved every viral infection for which it has been tried. And I don't know of any exceptions and in talking doctors who've, who've done this clinically, they don't have any exceptions as well. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about bowel tolerance or vitamin C, which is a way of kind of mimicking what you can get from intravenous vitamin C. It's the way of getting your vitamin C up as high as you can outside of a hospital. There's some vitamin C um, pathways where you have, um, if you have enough vitamin C around, the inner circle tends to operate to the greatest degree and that means that when vitamin C forms a, a radical anion, it's immediately recycled back to ascorbate. Um, but at high levels of oxidation, the outer circle um, activates where you have a double oxidation to dehydroascorbic acid, and that breaks down into um, oxalate. So on the left is the, this diagram here and it shows the potential clinical complications of um, oxalate from vitamin C metabolism. Um, oxalate is one of the substances that can form kidney stones. And when oxalate is combined with immune system um, problems and bacterial infections and an imbalance of calcium, you can get kidney stone formation. And so it's important to understand the relative degree of those different kinds of things. One of the clinical uh, aspects of vitamin C is that even though this has been highly popularized that vitamin C causes kidney stones, in studies where high doses of vitamin C have been, have been uh, used, kidney stones are basically unheard of. And uh, I think that's because high dose vitamin C um, augments immune system, prevents bacterial infections and clears them up, and also helps slightly with um, managing the calcium magnesium balance in vitamin K, vitamin K2. Oops. Wrong key. This is my bowel tolerance protocol to make this as easy as possible. Vitamin C absorption is proportional to the degree of your oxidative stress and the course of your um, severity of your infection. So basically you're flirting with diarrhea. You time your doses, start with some random time like an hour and then you take doses of vitamin C every time the ti timer goes off. And if you have loose stool, you increase the time. That means you're lowering your vitamin C dose. If you do not have loose stool, you decrease the time, which is increasing your vitamin C dose. And because bowel tolerance is a moving target, you have to pay attention. If you're asleep, you just start your next dose when you wake up. If the times get too short for your convenience, if you're taking a gram of vitamin C every nine minutes, double the dose and double the time. Here's an example of vitamin C in a therapeutic situation. This is the COVID-19 critical care group in the United States, a group of doctors who are using vitamin C intravenously. 
and they had multiple patients that they were treating. And here was one that um, they stopped the vitamin C too early in the process. And so after several days, the client, their, their, their client had fully recovered in terms of what they could observe. They stopped the vitamin C and the C-reactive protein just spiked again in very short order. And then when they realized what was going on, they resumed vitamin C and it came back down again. They continued it for a week afterwards and she recovered with no problem at all. Oops, sorry. <laughs> well, the last slide, I think this is the last slide. Yes, okay. So um, let's open it up for questions for me or do we wanna move on and, and do our second presentation? Allison? There were, really? yeah. <laughs> there were so many questions already popping up that I think it makes sense to uh, take them now. And then if, you know, Amy wants to chime in uh, and take it away with her presentation, that's okay. also totally fine. I think Creon was collecting. Sharing. That's great. Thank you. Maybe you have to start sharing again in a second, but Creon was popping in with the first Here. question. And if anyone else had a question that was uh, made uh, th that was actually addressed uh, to Steve that he should address here, then uh, go for it again and mark it with a cue in the chat so I can flag it. Creon, you go first. Oh, yeah, I had a bunch of questions. But I'll just uh, try and do them in order from memory. So um, you had a list of a number of different substances that uh, appear to be correlated uh, or better with COVID uh, recovery or prevention. Um, what about, I noticed vitamin K wasn't on that list, and I think I've seen some pretty highly suggestive stuff that vitamin K is correlated with better prognosis for COVID and that particularly uh, deficiency in K2 is correlated with worse prognosis. And then yes. also there's some- uh, let, me, let me answer that before we go right. on and let, get, let you get your second answer. The reason that it's not on the list is because the list can't be, this was a 10 minute presentation and can't be on the list. It's a discussion in the book and the problem with K2 is it's a mild coagulation agent and clotting agent. And it's and COVID has a severe risk towards uh, coagulation and clotting defects and is probably tied to this a lot of this end stage organ um, uh, uh, clotting and also fibrosis. And so it's very important to do your K2 with something like heparin or natokinase and, and maybe even magnesium therapy. So that's why it's not on the list, not because it's not um, important. It's right. just not primary. What, was magnesium on your list? I don't recall. No, it's, but it's, it's all part of that issue of calcium toxicity. Yeah, right. Calcium toxicity, big deal. Uh, yeah. Most people don't seem to know about um, being, popping calcium supplements all the time. Um, that's and, right. Um, yeah. Then um, any thoughts on melatonin? There seems to be some suggestive stuff. Uh, on yes, that. absolutely. Um, but so, so just real quick on vitamin K before we move on from vitamin K. Uh, okay, I've heard Carl. that vitamin K helps um, with high dose vitamin D avoid any of the toxicity associated with high vitamin D. Yes, it's because it's moderating calcium and vitamin D is facilitating calcium. So the K allows your body to manage it on a tissue level so that you don't get calcification of your soft tissues, you get the benign calcium in your soft tissues and that directs calcium into your hard tissues so yes um, Priyam, okay. go ahead yeah then um one more uh, while we're on sup uh, while we're on uh, supplements um oh you said you melatonin mean? yes yeah absolutely yeah. melatonin is is very um uh, uh useful and important but i wouldn't put it as being um, I don't know yet whether or not it's directly tied to COVID or whether or not it's a general um, antioxidant and facilitator of oxidative stress. And so that's one of the problems that we have with many of these therapeutics. They're all tested in a vitamin C deficient population. And so anything that has some easing effect on vitamin C oxidation is going to be therapeutic because that's the critical point that kills people is when they lose their vitamin C status. Uh, that's very interesting. Okay, so one last one on the supplement stuff. Um, what is your take, uh, especially given your high doses, on vitamin A uh, toxicity in maximum tolerable dose and the real story on that? Well, for COVID, I think you only have to take it in the first few days. Um, and maybe it might be useful to take it for a week or two weeks. 
you know, but you, that it, take, but you said you take 150 percent. I take 15,000 a day. Yeah, but that's above the recommended allowance by a significant amount. And you presume you don't, you're not, you don't have COVID. You take this all the time, right? I take it all the time. Yeah. So I would double and triple it if I had, if I came down with COVID symptoms. I've got clients on 100,000 a day, 25,000 a day, 100,000 a day. One is taking um, close to 200,000 a day. So this whole idea that 10,000 is in some way a cumulative toxin is just a myth. And it's not that it, it might not happen, but it's a, a substantial minority of the population can tolerate doses well above 10,000. Steve, tell us, why would somebody need that much? Um, immune system regulation issues, um, metabolic balancing issues. It's not, they're, they're, I don't know that there's a clear answer to that in terms of some, something highly specific. But, you know, somebody would, might have, for example, uh, tinnitus. So they've got an overt symptom. And if they take, you know, 50 or 100,000 units of vitamin A, their tinnitus goes away. That's a sign that it's doing something that's important for them. And also, um, some people with vitamin A may be medicating zinc at the same time because zinc and vitamin A have some synergies with respect to each other. And so if you're just doing zinc therapy or you're doing vitamin A therapy, it may be that your body wants both of them and in the absence of both, it'll do better with more of one. Okay, one last one. Um, on the vitamin C bowel tolerance thing, is that a thing that you're recommending for general prophylactic use all the time? Or is that something that you just recommend when you're under acute uh, danger or infection from a virus? The latter. I see. So, so my vitamin C intake is between two and four grams a day on a daily basis. That puts me halfway between the human RDA level and the mammal standard level. Puts me right in the middle. Um, so I'm about 10%, well, log scale. So I'm about 10% of what um, a, a cat, dog, horse, pig, cow, whatever would be taking, would be having in their tissues. All right, thank you. We had another question from Larry. Also, also let me also add, flirting with diarrhea is not a lifestyle. Good. <laughs> I mean, I, I think vitamin C, you know, is showing some benefit. I mean, Merrick's work with sepsis, although it's been difficult to reproduce, and now the Math Plus protocol has been, you know, looks very successful, at least compared to other hospital protocols. But yes. the antiviral stuff, I mean, vitamin C is, a lot of people try it against HIV and herpes, and it doesn't get rid of HIV or herpes. So, so, so I don't think it has, you know, activity against it doesn't, but that's those are all viruses. those are chronic viruses. It's, 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 it's probably actually good against bacteria viruses. that uh, you know, like that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it doesn't. You know, it, it it's not against all the viruses that you, know, you may have said that you may not have meant it, or maybe I missed no, that point. No, it's yeah. useful against all lipid envelope viruses. Vitamin C is, well, but yeah, HIV. It's, it's an acute herpes are all lipid envelope, but it does um, work yeah. with herpes, but. Um, it's for a, the acute phase of herpes. So if you have herpes encephalitis, vitamins, if IV vitamin C will save your life. But it yeah. will not get rid of chronic herpes at all. But um, yeah. even BHT that's very effective against um, uh, chronic viral diseases doesn't get rid of it either. I mean, none of the antivirals get rid of the virus. It's once you've got herpes on board, no, no, on that's board true. forever. That's correct. I mean, it, you know, again, it, it's just been reinterpreted the way you were saying things that it would, you know, actually get rid of some of these chronic viruses. And even the acute infection HIV, I mean, it, it, it hasn't been shown to, to really get rid of that or, you, you know, or even knock it down, at least, some, you know, some of the things that I've, that I've seen on it. But, but I, I mean, don't know I think, anybody I think, who's actually done that. I did hear. I, I think there's some people had had tried it in, in the 80s and things like that. There were there, there were some. I mean, there was all kinds. Yeah, of but things the, in the, 80s. the problem with that kind of work yeah. is that they when they were yeah. doing the PCR analyses or the viral load, you know, antibody studies and yeah. stuff like that, they yeah. would do those every two, four, six, eight weeks, and they would do the vitamin C for days. And so, if you're not looking at it in the time frame of the actual presence of high dose vitamin C you can't see the effects. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Merrick stuff, but I mean, it hasn't been reproduced, so that's been some of the problem. I mean, they've tried to reproduce in Brazil, they tried to reproduce it, and he claims they waited too long, and may maybe that's the case. But um, but again, I think, you know, to 
you know, to, I, I, it, it, it had a lot of, you know, press and things like that. And, but it just hasn't, yeah. you know, worked itself out with sepsis. And, and part uh, of that is the know. dose, you know, the, yeah. the Merrick protocol, yeah. he says high dose protocol, but it's not even slightly. It's, I mean, you can get higher vitamin C levels taking vitamin C orally. Um, there's no need yeah. to resort to IV when you're doing doses of 12 grams or six grams or even 24 yeah. grams. But that was sure. the protocol before, but he dropped it to 12. And at that yeah. point, when you're, if you're burning through your vitamin C that fast, um, it's not going to work. I mean, Merrick himself yeah. lost two of his elderly patients because he had a limit of 24 um, grams a day that he wouldn't go above, or at least he, he says that he didn't. But um, for some of these people who are, have so many pre-existing conditions, you have to give people 24 or 50 grams two, three, four, five times a day in order to to yeah. um, handle that oxidative load to keep their vitamin C from collapsing. Yeah. No, no, it, it's just really tough to do studies on this one. There's, you know, no strong commercial interest. I mean, we've seen protocols like yeah. clomidine and Celebrex that look like they work all the time too, but, you know, to get a trial and then if you do a little inhalation steroid or something now that looks good and, you know, at the right time, I guess. But it is really tough to to do this stuff. And, no, and there's always caveats, I mean, to, you know, they, with, with the studies. But, yeah, yeah, but that's it's, it's a real issue that there's no inexpensive way to do good. Yeah, so herpes would be an example that, that I would problem. consider to be yeah. more of a chronic kind of viral condition, whereas influenza, that would be an example of one that's pretty much always acute. And even though you might have low levels of influenza titers on a regular basis an extended period of time, and it might fl fluctuate up and down depending upon when you're smart and when you're stupid, um, the, the whole, you know, Typically, a, 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 a flu infection would be a few days to a few weeks. And um, vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C, is incredibly effective in shutting that down um, in the time frame of the, um, the IV infusion. Um, I had several long discussions with Cathcart, who probably treated 2,000 patients with intravenous vitamin C. And he told me stories about people who were uh, coming in with you know, high fevers and, and, you know, flus, and he would put them on the, on the chair, give them an IV drip. And then they'd start talk during the drip, they'd start talking about going out and getting one more run that same day. And, and what, what do you think the mechanism is, Steve? I mean, you know, vitamin C, of course, is necessary for, you know, collagen, I had for formation of hydroxyproline and things like that. I mean, what do you think it's in anti antiviral mechanism is? I think it's functioning primarily as an antioxidant. It's mediating the oxidative stress that's happening on the tissue level and preventing oxidative pathologies from cascading into uh, mortality or morbidity. So it's not direct antiviral activity. It's really sort of calming down a, a, an immune response or, or what? It's what you... that, but it's also preventing pathology. So if your vitamin C drops down, what happens to your inflammation? It goes through the roof. And it's not just because vitamin C is deficient, it's also because vitamin C is used, for example, in collagen maintenance. So if all of a sudden yeah. your collagen yeah. stops being maintained, your MMP yeah. levels go through the ceiling in your tissues. Yeah. So not only is your vitamin C crashing in your tissues, your MMPs are going through the roof in your tissues, your, your immune system can no longer target infected versus non-infected tissue. But the collagen effect takes a little bit of time though. I mean, that's... Um... No. You, you don't think so? You don't think it's... Um, no. Because collagen has a long half-life, I mean, you know. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the whole issue of how fast these kinds of things operate, I, I mean, you can take somebody with collagen problems, let's say ease of bruising, and put, take, give them on vitamin C, and the next day they won't bruise. Or you give them okay. transdermal copper, and their, their veins will, in, in 24 hours, their veins will stop rolling. Okay. All right, no, great, so, Steve. Thanks. I, I got to go to another meeting, but it's really good stuff. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Larry. All right, thank you so much, um, Sonia. Did, was your question meant for uh, the video discussion, or was it meant for the chat? I just want to make sure that we have all potential questions covered before we move on to Amy. Uh, sure. Yeah, we can ask it. Uh, my question about uh, how do we know if the vitamin D? So when you were giving your presentation. Um, 
uh, you know, you were talking about how people with low vitamin D and low selenium levels um, had issues, but isn't maybe they just have bad diets and they have low levels of everything. I mean, how do you, how do you sort that out? Well, if you just look at the distribution of, of vitamin D levels and selenium levels in the population, you can see that um, this is not a rare thing. I mean, but maybe a lot of people just have bad diets. That might not be rare either. You know what I'm saying? And, like, and, how do you how do you know it's vitamin D? Yeah, people avoid the yeah. sun. They may not. They may want white skin. They may think that uh, sunlight will give them skin cancer. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why people will do those kinds of things. And selenium is found in certain plants and, and foods to different degrees, depending upon what soil your food is grown in. So for example, um, one of the popular recommendations for selenium is Brazil nuts. And mm -hmm. Brazil nuts and Zika nuts and are, are concentrators in, in South Africa and, um, or excuse me, in, in South America and Africa for selenium. If the, if the soil has selenium, the, the Brazil nuts will have it. But an individual Brazil nut can have 200 micrograms of selenium in it if selenium in it, if it's grown in the Amazonas region, and other ones can have less than 20 and maybe even two milligrams if they're grown in another region of Brazil. So the issue of how much selenium you're getting is not something that you can predict by what you're eating. You can't tell looking at a Brazil nut how much selenium it has. Wow, so I'm eating way too many calories, maybe for no benefit when I eat the Brazil nuts. <laughs> or you're getting borderline selenium toxicity from eating the recommended six Brazil nuts with 200 micrograms in each one, and you're now have, you're in the top one percentile of selenium. I think it's better to be in the top quartile. And so that means three quarters of the population have sub suboptimal levels of selenium. And for vitamin D, it's probably 80% of people have suboptimal levels of vitamin D, depending upon whether you pick the 30 to 40 as your target zone, or the maybe 40 to 55 is your target zone. In that situation, maybe it's 90% of people have suboptimal levels. So when you're looking at the issue of life extension and optimizing lifespan, it's not an issue of, of diet, it's an issue of optimizing each of the factors that you can identify as being relative to your survival and sustainability of your health. Can I ask a follow-up question to that then? I don't know yeah. if anyone's, I, hopefully no one asked this because I walked away for a second, but um, how do you know what the optimum levels are? I mean, like Carl did this big write-up on vitamin D and like there's, I, I guess the levels of vitamin D that have been recommended have been wrong because some mistake and like, how do we even know, right? I don't know that you can. I mean, if you look at clinical uh, issues for yourself, you might be able to make some kind of determination if you've got, a system that's complaining to you. So if you have, mm -hmm. let's say, joint pain, well, a lot of different reasons you might. You might be allergic, uh, reactive to solanine and nightshade vegetables, but you could have a copper deficiency. So if you do have joint pain and it's bilateral and you put copper, topical copper cream on one knee and not the other knee and the pain goes away in that knee and s remains in the other knee, that pretty much diagnoses what's going on as being a copper deficiency using yourself as a control. Right. But okay. optimum is still an open question. You put copper <laughs> cream on every day, you put a teaspoon on, you put a, a finger dab. I mean, that's an entirely different question. So, so Sonia, the, the, the sort of more background the answer to your question of how do they determine levels is you go read the Institute of Medicine giant report on each vitamin where they reviewed the literature and decided what the right levels are for supplementation. and. For most of them, they're very good, and for the vitamin D one, they happen to make a huge statistical mistake. Well, there's an emerging medical technology that's going to make a lot of this um, testing obsolete, and that is wearables. And so a lot of aspects of what we do will be, will be able to be fed back to us through all kinds of performance parameters that can be converted, can be, you can get a data stream from by a wearable. And if you have issues with coagulation, for example, and you take K2 and your coagulation goes through the roof, you know, okay, that dose is not okay for me, for you at that particular point in time. But if you were to up your vitamin C and take natokinase on top of um, the, the K2, maybe that would be no longer a limitation on your performance. So right now we're kind of res 
we're kind of stuck with what I call one-time tests. These are tests that are stable over the course of time. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether you get tested in the morning or noon or in the evening. Um, if there's going to be an abnormality, it'll show up. And those are things that are just um, uh, stable and unchanging over time. But life is dynamic. Life is about rhythm. Life is about ebb and flow of different processes. And if you have a perfectly damp system, you're not going to live very long. And so that's what wearables give us, is the technology to measure those things that are dynamic, that are actively changing on a regular basis, and then develop a whole new kind of medicine relating to correlations between all those different mobile factors. Yeah, I'd like to just second one thing about that, um, which is that, you know, once I started wearing a continuous glucose monitor, everything changed for me. You know, that's just one example. Grant, Thank can you, you lead in a little bit closer to your microphone? Thank you. Thank I you. said once I started wearing a continuous glucose monitor, everything changed for me. I mean, I don't wear it anymore because I learned what I needed to learn. Well, but perhaps you, you can share whatever devices uh, but you, you found that, here in the chat. Yeah, but you found out that your glucose wasn't stable and it was reacting and there, that gave you, you know, hour by hour, minute by minute kind of data that you couldn't get access to by finger prick testing or by going to the doctor and getting a fasting glucose test in the morning. Uh, I think the uh, topic of what devices and which things we can get in real, real time feedback on is a whole other topic that is very, very interesting. And I completely agree with you, Stephen, that it's just super, super important and exactly agree with John that it will change everything for each different thing. And some of them are harder. Yeah. But it's a little, getting a little off topic for today. Yeah. 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 Please share uh, any, uh, you know, any recommendations that you have here in the chat. And uh, thank you so, so much, Steve. I already had a few requests for your slides. So if you want to share them, that would be amazing. I for now, we're moving. Yeah. Awesome. For now, we're moving on to Amy Pural, who uh, was able to join us again here today to uh, present on uh, her research on vitamin D specifically. So Amy, thank you so, so much for joining. I can't wait for it. And uh, then we have a few more comments for the group discussion. Amy, thank you for joining. Ah, you, I think you're muted. I can unmute you if you don't mind. Everyone hear me now? Yep. Perfect. All right, now I'm gonna share my screen and I am going to go to, oh my gosh, um, keynote. Okay, and here and play. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Super, yep. Awesome, okay, so, um, this is, I was told to talk for 10 minutes and um, the topic of vitamin D um, is something I spent six or more years on um, as part of my graduate work. So um, it's hard to condense into 10 minutes. So my goal is to give you a very basic overview and then hopefully you can follow up with questions. So with vitamin D, um, just a warning, um, we spent years going into, this is a team I worked with previously, not my current research team, going into the very detailed molecular biology of the vitamin D system. Not just a single vitamin D metabolite, but the entire vitamin D system, which as you'll see, is very complex, which means that the topic of vitamin D supplementation, at least to our team, is actually not simple at all and is one of the more complicated topics out there that is possible to study. So let me give you a little bit of background on why we have come to believe that's the case. So, okay, we know, um, and again, my, I'm going to say that I personally have found the topic to be oversimplified. And just to go off this, we know that there are two trends with COVID and vitamin D supplementation. One is that, as, as was mentioned previously, that people with low levels of the metabolite 25D, which is usually obtained impartially through food and supplements, have a higher risk of a severe COVID case. That is true. Also, hospitalized patients, I think there's one or two studies that show benefit from vitamin D supplementation in hospitalized COVID patients. I agree with those trends. Now the question, however, is what's going on and what is vitamin D doing in those patients? Now we come at this from a different okay. viewpoint of many teams, so I hope you're prepared for that. So we actually do not, our research as you will see, does not support the fact that vitamin D deficiency as a problem, we are exploring the possibility that low levels of 25D in a person with an infectious or chronic disease state are actually tied to the disease process as opposed to being a sign of pure deficiency. 
So there are two main forms of vitamin D, um, at least a, in our research. One is 25D, um, acquired again via food and supplements, and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, sometimes called D3, that's acquired via sunlight, also produced by the body. Now, neither form of those, in our opinion, should really be called a vitamin. They're secosterol transcriptional activators, and, and 125D is a hormone and secosterol transcriptional activator. So you have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about what we're doing with this uh, substance substances actually. Now, what's really important is, in our opinion, the vitamin D receptor is what both with both the main forms of vitamin D that I mentioned there, that's what they control. And the vitamin D receptor is a type one nuclear receptor and DNA transcription factor that controls a tremendous number of human genes. So this is a 2005 study, and I apologize if there's been some updates in this, but even in 2005, it was understood that the VDR controls almost the expression of almost a thousand genes. Those genes are connected to cancers, to autoimmune conditions, and as you'll see here, so vitamin D receptor, among the many genes that it expresses, tumor metastasis suppressor protein one, for example, but also regulates key families of antimicrobial peptides, which are in incredibly important parts of the innate immune response to uh, infectious agents, and also controls expression of TLR4 and TLR2 to an extent, which again is very important for a robust innate immune response. So the vitamin D receptor itself has been called uh, by many people the gatekeeper to the innate immune response. So with that in mind, this is a paper, uh, diagram that our team ended up publishing in the journal Bioassays on vitamin D metabolism. This is the, at the center of it, you can see activated VDR. Now, one of the things that we characterize, and this is really based off a lot of molecular modeling and a lot of work through the scientific literature. This is, by the way, not a complete, this is our model of vitamin D metabolism that has been favorably supported by many teams, but it's not like this is in a textbook. This is in a paper. Okay. So now, what is really important to understand is that, of course, one of the most important nuclear receptors in the body that plays a really incredibly role, in, important role in controlling the innate immune response and expression of so many human genes is going to be tightly controlled by very complex feedback and feed forward transcriptional pathways, right? So if you have VDR at the center, you basically have this system where at the very least the metabolites are interfacing with other nuclear receptors and there's a huge amount of enzymes and other activity that that the body will use to regulate what's happening with this important system connected to immunity and gene expression now if you come back to the two main ligands that i talked about before 125d and 25d this is a paper we published quite a while ago, to be honest. And it's called the alternative hypothesis. I'll get there in a bit for the reason that this is molecular modeling of 125D and 25D as like positioned when they bind into the VDR. And both these of these metabolites are ligands for, for the VDR. So they will affect activity of that nuclear receptor. Now, we found that, the, that 25D has an additional hydroxyl group that causes it to act differently than 125D. So in simple terms from the molecular biology, we found that 25D is an antagonist of VDR activity and 125D, the active vitamin D metabolite is an agonist of VDR activity. And now I think that would be expected because there is no other feed, feed ways, feed, pathway systems in the body in which there are only agonists for a receptor. It makes sense that if there's an important receptor, there would be at least one ligand that would slow activity of that receptor's ex gene expression and one that would activate it, right? So what does that mean then if you have these metabolites that have different effects on VDR function? So, oops, here. Okay, what that means to us is that if the vitamin D receptor controls the innate immune response, 125D we found was an activator of VDR expression and thus would activate the innate immune response. 25D, according to our modeling, is an antagonist, would slow activity of the vitamin D receptor and slow the innate immune response. So according to our research, vitamin D supplementation is immunosuppressive. It lowers activity of the innate immune response. So in our opinion, vitamin D supplemental can be used as an excellent palliative. And this is why you will see that many patients with many chronic inflammatory conditions come into the doctor, they're given high dose vitamin D, and they do feel better. There's no doubt about that because there's so much chronic inflammation in any chronic condition. 
And what that means is that supplemental vitamin D is a very effective, if we are correct with this molecular biology tool, in suppressing an excessively uh, activated immune response, such as would be found in a cytokine time storm, storm syndrome in a patient with COVID who was hospitalized, correct? Now, to go further into that, we are not the only team who has found that trend to be the case. Back in 2007, whenever we would go to, and I've been to many conferences on uh, inflammatory disease, autoimmune disease, many doctors use it as a deliberate palliative, right? So here, this is a team um, and they're finding, you know, it's a, this is one of the top teams in autoimmune disease research. And, you know, on the whole, the, some of this paper is on the whole vitamin D. And by that, they mean supplemental vitamin D, which is first converted into 25D confers an immunosuppressive effect. Now, if you go from there, you say, what's going on when 25D is low in patients with, you name it, every chronic condition? As we know, that's what the definition of vitamin D deficiency is. Low levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D associated with every chronic condition. Well, we started to wonder what was going on and if we should better flush out the molecular biology of what was going on there. And so what we did is we tested in a group of 100 patients. Many of these patients had either an MS diagnosis, fibromyalgia diagnosis, chronic Lyme diagnosis, um, or I think, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, we tested not just 25D, but also 125D in such patients, which is never done, which is seldom done, I should say. At the time, it was almost never done. And the sad reason for that is it, when I ask doctors, they tell me that the Quest test for 125D, for example, Quest Diagnostics is really expensive and thus they choose not to order it. So it's not really not ordered for reasons other than certain financial reasons. So what we found, as you can see, is that in, these, in this cohort of patients, at least, people who had low levels of 25D tended to have 125D levels that were well above range. So now when we have both metabolites in this picture, is that deficiency? Because we actually have one metabolite that's low, but one that's very high. So what does that mean now? So what we began to wonder is, are the low levels of vitamin D that we're noticing, the 25D form, is that indicative of some form of modulation of the vi vitamin D system as opposed to being just a strict indicator of a deficiency of a so-called vitamin, right? So we began to pursue that hypothesis a bit more. And what we did is we realized is at the same time we were studying the role of persistent pathogens in the development of chronic conditions like MS, like Alzheimer's disease, which by the way has been further substantiated by this point in time where that topic is really ongoing at the moment. So persistent viruses like the herpes viruses and teroviruses, even pathogens like Borrelia, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, how these persistent organisms in many cases can contribute to many chronic inflammatory diseases. And what we began to find was a very interesting trend, which was that most pathogens that have been studied in this capacity so can produce proteins or metabolites that interfere with VDR, vitamin D receptor activity. So here's an example. Epstein-Barr virus encodes the protein EBNA3 that binds directly into the vitamin D receptor and diminishes the it, it, in simple terms, it slows activity of the vitamin D receptor. And of course, what that does is in simple terms, slows activity of the innate immune response. Now, if you think about that, that is an amazingly intelligent pathogen, I realize survival strategy, correct? Because if you are a pathogen and you can create a protein that just regulates the receptor that controls the immune response that would otherwise target you, then you are much more likely to be able to better persist in that patient. So we found, you know, if you look at the literature now, this has been further substantiated. Um, here's a second example, um, Aspergillus uh, fumigatus, which is another, you know, common cystic fibrosis and other infections. It creates a gliotoxin that also binds into VDR and downregulates at its activity and the innate immune response. So we also, there's Borrelia does this. HIV basically completely levels VDR function to survive. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. MTB does cytomegalovirus. So there's many examples in the literature in which these persist and pathogens, which are actually very common in the human population, are having a dramatic effect on the activity of this receptor that's really critical to proper activity of the human innate immune response. So we went from there and said, is okay. Too early for COVID-19? It might. No. I, I think it would be really cool to study COVID in this capacity to see if it has any effect, direct effect on VDR function would be a great question. 
So, and I don't know if anyone's doing that yet, but it, we should. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, okay. So we ended up writing just um, multiple things on this and the, including this chapter, by the way, just if you guys want for future reference, that sort of ties together some of the work we were doing. And um, we were proposing that in simple terms, let me get to the next slide. Okay. Now, what may be in our, according to our research, what may be interpreted as vitamin D deficiency is the following. If you have VDR function and the, the, the activity of the VDR nuclear receptor is compromised either by the activity of a persistent pathogen or by other, you name it, chemicals, anything in the body that might be able to impede that receptor function, and thus the innate immune response. What happens is that, okay, VDR expresses CYP24A1. That enzyme it then can interface with what's called the PXR nuclear receptor. Sorry, this molecular biology is complicated. PXR then controls the level of vitamin D, pre-vitamin D is, so this, in, back, I'm going to the top of the diagram. Pre-vitamin D is converted into vitamin D. And then an enzyme, CYP27A1, is necessary for the conversion of vitamin D into the 25-hydroxy form that impacts the VDR. So what we found is that it, it, when VDR function is compromised, there's less expression of CYP24A1, which affects PXR activity, which then impacts um, activity of CYP27A1. And the final thing that happens there is that less vitamin D is converted into 25D. And what that leads to on a blood test in the doctor's office is lower levels of 25D, that metabolite, in patients with any chronic condition in which a pathogen or other environmental factor is negatively impacting activity of the vitamin D receptor. So we began to think that in patients with low levels of 25D, perhaps the levels were not indicative of a vitamin D vitamin deficiency, but were instead indicative that those patients were suffering from a more large inflammatory disease process that could involve persistent infection. So then this, what this means to us in terms of COVID is does this mean that when we see low levels of 25D correlated with a higher risk of COVID severity, it simply reflects the fact that patients who have more underlying conditions that are tied to the activity of persistent pathogens, which is by the way, most conditions at this point in time, are more likely to have severe COVID cases because it's reflecting a more substantial chronic inflammatory disease process. And furthermore, if our modeling is correct and 25D slows VDR function, then could hospitalized COVID patients be benefiting from supplementation because it actually mitigates the cytokine storm. So what that suggests to us is that vitamin D needs to be used very carefully in the treatment of disease based on stage of illness. Our work suggests that in early stage disease, you would not want to supplement with vitamin D because that could inactivate the innate immune response over time. However, if you got to later stages of COVID where the immune system was, response was exacerbated, vitamin D could be a valuable tool in toning that down. And indeed, there's been, I'll get back to that slide. There's been some studies, um, for example, this one in COVID where a team looked at, you know, overall T cell function and different regulation of vitamin D, but they found that um, overall genes that were, th this is gonna get complicated. Vitamin D was a good substitute for dexamethasone supplementation. And I real the forms that come into this paper, it's too complicated for me to explain at the moment. Um, it is worth noting that our previous work, which taps on the work of another research team before us, this is molecular modeling. We previously found that 125, 125-hydroxy vitamin D and dexamethasone have really similar binding affinities for the alpha thyroid receptor. And that goes to a second topic that I don't have time to talk about, which is that when 125-D, the active vitamin D metabolite rises above range, it can bind into many receptors like alpha thyroid that it would not normally bind into. So there's other flow on effects of vitamin D modulation that impact the basically most nuclear receptor function in the human body. But so there can be many correlations between vitamin D activity and drugs like dexamethasone. So 
that's it. Um, let's see, I'll go back to this. I do want to point out that in, if we are on the right track, most randomized controlled trials that have been done on vitamin D supplementation for any condition have not found that vitamin D supplementation is beneficial over the long term. So there is short-term palliation with patient symptoms, but the long-term outcomes have not held up. This is, for example, an RCT that actually just looked at bone health in older women, and women had an increased risk of fracture over the long term, as would be expected if vitamin D supplementation was immunosuppressive, as opposed to some sort of panacea in which it just helps you somehow all the time. And also, um, you know, you can look at any RCT, depression, cancer, you name it. The trend in terms of benefit does not hold into the later stages of disease when the more profound effects of immunosuppression via high dose use of vitamin D would manifest. So that would be my takeaway, <laughs> my summary. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, Carl, would you like to make a few comments? And then we have a question by Kuyon. Uh, let's see, I'm going to so, try to so unshare I want to say a couple of things about the, so I've studied extensively the uh, literature that's come out this year that specifically um, examines vitamin D and COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very curious to hear Amy's take on a couple things. Um, uh, first of all, and the, the two things that, I, that I'd like to hear her take on, uh, I'm just going to list a couple things and then and I'll turn it back over. So, so historically, pre-COVID-19, um, it's important to note that the Institute of Medicine, when setting the um, RDA for vitamin D, specifically for bone health, uh, examined the literature and made a statistical error uh, in 2010 to 2011, which was published, correct students for it were published in 2014, 2015, that showed that instead of 600 IU per day, the correctly calculated um, amount would have been something like 8,000 IU per day or on a bigger day the set that they came up with later, 6,000 IU per day. Um, so that's one piece of background. And then, um, and that's just, that was nominally just for bone health without considering the other potential benefits to health. Um, then in 2017, there was a big meta-analysis um, of all of the RCTs on respiratory infections by uh, Martinel, uh, published in BMJ, which examined 25 RCTs and showed that vitamin D had a, had a beneficial effect at mitigating um, respiratory infections, at least for the, for the ones that showed daily uh, dosing, not large bolus doses. Um, at, at least for the patients that had low starting levels. Um, yes. And then that, there's a preprint, in case you haven't seen it, there's a preprint just released a month or so ago, which expanded that study to 40 RCTs and also showed benefit. Um, okay, so now moving into the, uh, the, the COVID-related things, um, there are several things, which you can see my one paper for, that show that um, there's a causal link. It's not just correlation, and so it can't the, the relationship between low D levels and bad COVID-19 outcomes, which Amy, you, you seem to acknowledge, at least for the anti-inflammatory effects, there's a lot of interesting data that just everyone should be aware of that shows that it's potentially causal and not just correlative data. There's a Mendelian randomization study um, there that shows, for example, that um, uh, African Americans in the U.S. have much, much worse overall load relative to other ethnicities the farther north you go in the U.S., which um, doesn't really have a, a good, easy confounder explanation. And there's also a causal inference model by uh, Davies et al., which is very, very compelling. Um, uh, there's one um, Singapore hospital that did a timed intervention study. It wasn't a randomized controlled study, but it was a temporally controlled study, but that was pretty low end. But most importantly and interestingly, just a few days ago, there's a new randomized controlled study of hospitalized patients, uh, giving them um, vitamin D, and uh, it, was, it was not too small. It was, there were 26 untreated patients in the control and uh, 50, I think, treated patients. And of the treated patients, 2% uh, of them had to go into the ICU, and of the untreated patients, 50% of them had to go into the ICU. So that's somewhat compelling. Um, so, so I guess the high level question, Amy, is would you support the notion that vitamin D supplementation should be used on all COVID patients who reach the level of 
being admitted to the hospital. Yes, I think that co vitamin D should be studied more in a hospital setting for its ability to palliate information in a way that is similar to a drug like dexamethasone. Yes, absolutely. Well, I don't you know. Vitamin yeah. D as being less, um, you know, dangerous than dexamethasone. It very well could be. And that's why I think it would be really cool to study it in that capacity. And yes, I mean, anytime that a substance is more tightly regulated and, you know, to the, with the body, understanding how that substance works and then using that in concert with the body's own metabolism is, is more likely to have potentially a better impact than an artificial drug that's, you know, I mean, it, I'm not saying for sure, but certainly I think that, that vitamin D should be studied as a potential alternative to dexamethasone. Absolutely. Yes. Um, also, Leslie, did you see that there's a, a preprint that shows that the calcitriol specifically has direct antiviral uh, action against the SARS-CoV-2 molecule? No. So I haven't seen that. So there's a, a couple of things you brought up now. And so one thing that I have to say is that when you look at that diagram that we made of vitamin D metabolism, you can see how... Um, you know, everything from stage of disease to, you know, all kinds of variables in an individual patient are going to affect how those feedback pathways are functioning. So there really isn't some set, you know, like everyone should take in, in our thing, everyone should take this exact dose or everyone's in this place because everyone, and this is the few, this is personalized medicine. Everyone has, you know, either a certain pathogen load that's already affecting VDR activity, or they already have other issues with, you know, related nuclear receptor function that's going to impact how the vitamin D system works. So overall, um, the, you know, it, it's probably, we should be looking at vitamin D as first of all, on a personalized level, as opposed to, in my opinion, we'd be better to move away from an RDA um, kind of overall, it, it, I don't think we should treat vitamin D as a vitamin. I think we should treat it as a secosteroid transcriptional activator. And I think it would be, you know, if you think of another nuclear receptor, like the uh, uh, estrogen beta that I was showing there, and you think of the ligands that affect estrogen beta, or let, let's say the glucocorticoid receptor, which is also a nuclear receptor. If, if we said, oh, people should take um, androgen, you know, as a, as a supplement, people, because it's low on your test or something, people would be like, hold on, what? So I do think that we need to impose every time that we say the word vitamin D, we should say secosteroid transcriptional activator and potentially hormone vitamin D. Now trying to figure out where those, those two forms are always fluctuating and changing based on feedback feed forward pathways in anyone. Now, one of the things that you mentioned was that it's really interesting trend and I hope this, I realize that everything is probably very complicated with our work, but if you already have low 25D levels and you haven't been supplementing yet, and you ingest more vitamin D, according to our work, some of that ingested vitamin D will be converted into 125D, which is the metabolite that our work shows activates the vitamin D receptor. So in those cases, if you start with a low level of 25D, you can use that in the moment to increase 125D, which could potentially have in immunosupportive effects. So in some of the, you mentioned a paper that found that people who had low levels of 25D to begin with were more likely to benefit from some supplementation. And I would agree with that. And that's because it's more likely to convert at that point into the 125D form that could be an agonist, right? Now, the other thing is that, you know, and people say this all the time, another trend with that is like, yes, vitamin D was used, for example, in the treatment of tuberculosis, you know, back in the day. And that's the same thing is if you're low in vitamin D to begin with, some of the, some of the ingested form or the form from sunlight will be 125D, which can, which can activate the VDR. So there's a point in infectious disease where if you have the right form, like 125D at the right level at the right time, you can improve immune function. The question is, does everyone you know, have that going on? And if you've already been supplementing, are you going to get to that point? And I, you know, contrary to what I realize is the, the main you know, drive at this point, our research suggests that no, if, you're, if you've already been long-term supplementing with high-dose vitamin D, you're no longer at a point where that's going to work for you. It sounds you're, like the logical, to, yeah, you know, like the logical consequence of your... Sorry, go ahead, finish. No, that's it. No, that's it. Just like... Uh, if it, you, yeah. 
this is great research. It sounds like the logical consequence of your research is that given how expensive it is to treat any COVID patient in hospital, there is just no excuse not to do both the 25D and the 125D tests on admission to every, to every COVID patient. Yes, I, I really actually think that every patient who's seen by doctors normally should have both those tests done on them. I, I just, it's, it's, I've tried back in the day when I was really doing this work, tried very hard just to get that message out, which was measure both metabolites. And it's still not done in the clinic. And I, I absolutely think it should be. Why would you not want information on the two, um, you know, you can test both forms. Why would you not want that information? That ratio, the way those two, that ratio is where you get the most information from. So yeah, no, absolutely. I would think that both metabolites should be tested. Is there any other way to assay the direct uh, activity level of VDR? Yeah, that's a tough one. So one of the problems that we had is that mice, murine models, the, the vitamin G literature can be complicated because of the fact that murine models are poor um, models for VDR. Unfortunately, vitamin D receptor function diverged millions of years ago in mice. And so the, my, the murine or mouse innate immune response is controlled by like a nitric oxide system that is not tied to VDR and VDR in a mouse does not express most of these innate. So, so unfortunately, a lot of teams, which makes sense, don't read that literature and do a lot of work in mice that can get become confusing because the VDR in a mice doesn't, you know, isn't controlling the same genes. So that's one problem with the literature. And also in, in any, in vitro, you know, in vitro work is fine, but any in vitro model is tough because you could, you could see in that diagram that what we're interested in at least is how these metabolites can also impact the other activity of other nuclear receptors or other related you know, signaling pathways. And a lot of times the in vitro models only account for the VDR metabolism itself without bringing in other parts that would allow a better understanding of the real dynamics of the cell. And so you have to be careful when you're looking at in vitro work to make sure that the team really did try to the best capacity they could to understand that the VDR system is connected to many other nuclear receptors and they didn't just try to study it in, in complete isolation, right? But, but that's, it's still a challenge, you know, it's very hard, you know, I don't have a perfect answer for you on, on how to do it, only to just keep those things in mind if you are, right? Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> hey, Korean. I have a, a, a question that's gonna divert us off is details, if you guys don't mind. That's fine. So, what do you think about the interesting uh, theory and some supporting evidence that flu season in the northern and southern hemispheres is basically low sunlight, big vitamin D deficiency season? No, unfortunately, I'm not sure that that is totally on the right track in my mind. I think that what you're seeing might be you know, other potentially, you know, again, we come from the perspective of, of persistent pathogens being involved in the underlying condition, conditions now that are connected to, you know, for example, even flu risk in the sense that if you're, COVID is not unique in that if you have an underlying condition or any kind of, you know, poor immune a system going on already, you will suffer more from any uh, acute infection, any infection you get, whether it's influenza or, you know, whatever, right? So I think that we need to better consider the fact that during the winter months, there can be issues with other topics related to immunity in patients that beyond sunlight. I, I don't know that there's there was a period where uh, you know, a lot of work was done on sunlight correlations for vitamin D. And it was, you know, while some of those are there, there's so many variables that impact these, you know, the study populations besides sunlight that there it's, it, it's, it's too hard for me to, to draw out a model in which we're looking at just not enough sunlight. No, okay, so you know, the thing, yeah. There's a related question then, mm -hmm. rather than sort of contradicting you, I'll ask this question. Mm -hmm. Has anyone, to anyone's knowledge, ever done a study of seasonal variation in otherwise healthy people in inflammatory markers? Uh, you know, because 
wouldn't that be interesting if during uh, cold season or flu season or whatever, people have chronically elevated inflammatory markers, whether it's because of low vitamin D, as you sort of suggest, or other things, maybe changes in diet, I don't know, but it's like, I think it'd be very, I don't know, and I just wonder, has anyone looked at seasonal variation in a wide variety of inflammatory markers over a big population? No, but one thing I would emphasize is that I think the study of vitamin D really needs to be honed into the details of the molecular biology, which is, as you can see, very complex. Again, I'm not exaggerating that we're dealing with one of the most complex systems in the human body and move away from studies that just look at correlation, causation, it, it, because you have to understand there, the I, I literally got to the point where back when we were doing this work more, I ended up talking to an evolutionary biologist, for example, at Princeton, because so many people would tell me like, okay, well, if vitamin D supplementation could be immunosuppressive, then how come our ancestors were getting a lot of vitamin D? And I, I was like, you know, there's all these kind of ideas that have been put out there, but this, you know, evolutionary biologist at Princeton was like, there's no evidence that our ancestors were even getting more sun. It seems like they, you know, in my opinion, they were coming out more at dusk where they would hunt, like, you know, there's, so one of the problems in the vitamin D community is, and I'm not saying it can't be done, is an over-reliance on studies that take trends like sunlight and this and try to correlate as opposed to just looking at the very specific molecular biology of what those the different vitamin D metabolites are doing in a given patient. And I do think so while I think that's interesting, the number of variables that can happen in the kind of study you're talking about could be huge. And that's the only thing that worries me is, you know, is like it could be done, but just correlating, you know, inflammatory state with vitamin D status and stuff. It, the, the, the thing is what I'm talking about is, and I'll just end with this, is the possibility that we're in a way confusing cause with effect, that we're not talking about deficiency as we are talking about, like a low 25B is less of an indicator of a vitamin D deficiency than an indicator that there's an underlying inflammatory disease process at work. And so what we really need to do to better flesh out whether that could or could not be the case is do studies again that focus on the molecular biology as opposed to the cause and effect associations because that doesn't help us understand the directionality of what does what. But yeah, I don't know. But Thank yeah. you. Totally on board with you, totally agree with you. From the point of view of what science should do going forward, that's very, very clear. Um, however, it's also very, very clear that vitamin D can be very, very helpful in this current acute crisis that society is having, and that that message is not getting out there enough and is um, and it's not getting used, it's not getting pushed by public uh, health, and it's not, and, and in fact, quite frankly, lots of public health bodies are coming out with very pessimistic, you know, commentary saying there's no evidence that it could help even in hospitalized patients. You know, the pharmaceutical industry is pushing, pushing dexamethasone. We, we get, we have this really bizarre status right now where dexamethasone is sort of standard of care. And if vitamin D were to try to prove itself, it would have to prove that it was better than dexamethasone, which is kind of backwards because it should be the, the anyway, yeah. my point is I, I, I want you to think about how your longer term a message that I agree with may cause confusion about what is possibly the shorter term, simpler message, which is just to push vitamin D for solving the pandemic in the short term better and quicker. And, and similarly for Stephen, um, you know, vitamin D is one of the many things in your book, and, and you've done lots of research on lots of these other things, and uh, I think that's great, and I can feel your frustration at some of the way society doesn't value these things. I think you're really right about a lot of them. But I also think that in the short-term acute situation, vitamin D stands out relative to a lot of the others, maybe not necessarily everyone, but certainly relative to a lot of them and having the most compelling story right now and possibly being a good enough one to help make a big difference in the current pandemic. And so I want you both to sort of just think, this is just a comment, not a question. I want you to just both think about you know, in the long term, your messages are great. And in the short term, how do you decide on how to prioritize, prioritize the parts of your messages to try to get some actual short term change? And maybe it's too hard and maybe you're not going to bother with that. I, I've tried to beat my head the last four or five months against the problem, trying to get public health officials to wake up, 
trying to get um, insurers to do things. I've been emailing with Kaiser. I'm on a mailing list with people in the UK who are who, who are trying to uh, email politicians and try to get um, people to not pay attention to this terrible nice report that claimed, you know ended by reviewing and ignoring all the preprints. Um, and it's kind of you're banging your head up against. Maybe some people claim conspiracy theories about big pharma trying to suppress these things. I don't know. My points to you are just consider the not trying to get the thing too confusing by going the one level deeper of the true biology and pushing the important thing of saving people's lives short term, at least until the pandemic's over. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. But at the same time, I would argue that the reason, and I'm not saying that farm, but there is actually quite a bit of money in vitamin D supplementation, and there's quite a big lobby for vitamin D use. I'm familiar with that. Um, they have power. The thing, though, that would make the, if you want to call it mainstream, more responsive to the use of vitamin D would be a better understanding of the very specific molecular biology of how it works. So I have to stick to the fact that I think we need to be very careful about the molecular biology and about state of disease, you know, stage of disease with this, with using this, because with that information is also what would allow it be, to be used in the right instance at the right time. Because for example, you've seen with hydroxychloroquine, how it didn't work to just say hydroxychloroquine might be good, right? Because unfortunately, like then they started testing it in the hospitalized patients and it doesn't work because we know it's important in early stage disease, right? So unfortunately, I worry that if you overgeneralize and leave out the distinctions tied to the molecular biology, that what you end up with is people testing it in the wrong way at the wrong time, which could actually backfire. I, don't know. I think Carlos frozen, unless he's speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Which I doubt. No, there he is. So, so Amy, one specific thing, for example, I think you should be, you're very credible. I think you should be shouting from the rooftops and advocating that all hospitals upon admission for COVID-19 should be testing both 25D and 125D. And, but, but you do have to be careful that if you shout that, that a lot of people are going to look at that and say no, where they might have said yes to just testing 25D. Uh, or just giving, or maybe instead of shouting they, they should be testing any of those, maybe you should be shouting that once they're in the hospital, they should just be given these supplements to prevent the yeah. cytokine storm. I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, I, first of all, am not shouting anything about vitamin D at the current moment because you can see that what I face is that if I try to explain why patients should, why you should test for 25 and 125, I have to then give this incredibly complicated explanation that I don't not even sure I fully did well, you know, here. So the problem is a, a regular MD goes, why? And I go, well, the vitamin D receptor is at the heart of the immune response and control. And, and like, there, so the pro one of the problems with vitamin D is that it's always easier to accept the simple arguments for why we should do something like, okay, and I'm not saying this is wrong, but someone goes, you should take it because of sunlight and people, doctors are like, got it, which is fair. But if you go look at this complicated molecular biology, they go like, I know, you know, and so part of the, so I just have been staying more quiet because what I would like is for more teams and there are some out there to try to replicate some of our work, which they are. There's a couple, there's a team at Karolinska and I'm trying to wait to see if we can get more back up on the molecular biology before I shout it too hard because I have to be able to, you know, really uh, back my statements up with, you know, specificity. So, but I, I, you know, if someone asked me like, would over the overall trends, yeah, no, I would, I would obviously say that I think that especially the fact that 125 or, you know, supplementation could be used to substitute for dexamethasone, absolutely. I would say, please study that more now. All right, that's a pretty tangible action item yeah. uh, for folks to, to be pushing. Thank you so, so much. I know that Steve had to drop uh, off for his, like, I think, fifth Zoom call today or something. Uh, so thank you so, so much to Steve, not here anymore, and you, Amy. It was really, really, really fantastic to have you both on. Um, I know that a few people are dying to get their hands on on your slides and I'll follow up with you and Steve afterwards and let us please know if there's anything that you think we should be specifically doing apart from the action item that you just mentioned uh, that would be helpful on this front. Thank you so much for sharing. Cool, no worries. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, awesome. Um, all righty. Uh, then I'm going to follow up with the rest of the group. I already talked to Isabel, Creon, and John, who were willing to postpone their presentations until next week. Um, and I know that you can look forward to a variety of uh, really good docs there. I'm going to open up um, a breakout room for those who want to continue to stay on. Thank you so, so, so much. I think you did a fantastic job, Amy, at like, um, you know, lay laying this out in sufficient detail while it also being a super complicated topic. So thank you so, so much, so, so much for um, bearing with us and, um, and for thinking that uh, that is worth it trying here. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to open up breakout rooms right now and I'm going to follow up with an email to all of you. And I'm also going to uh, later uh, share uh, a little uh, survey on what dates and times work best for everyone because I'm realizing that we're moving things. Um, and for that time, I just want to follow up with what's actually best for everyone when to meet. So um, be prepared to have a little survey. Um, and yeah, so for now, I'm going to open up a breakup room. Thank you so much for joining everyone. And I see you all again next week. Bye, bye.